So we begin with de developments in Yemen, where a Houthi military spokesman has confirmed to Al Jazeera that their fighters have hijacked a ship owned by an Israeli businessman in the southern Red Sea. At least 22 people were on board the Galaxy Leader, which was en route to Turkey from India. The Israeli military have called the situation a very serious event on a global level. Sarah Khaira is joining us from West Jerusalem to tell us more about the reaction coming out of there, Sarah. Yeah, well, we've heard uh, from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's office saying that it's actually 25 crew members. Uh, none of them are Israelis. It says that some of those on board are from Ukraine, uh, Mexico, uh, as well uh, as the Philippines and Bulgaria, but no Israelis on the ship. Also saying that that vessel is actually Brit a British ship uh, operated by a Japanese company. But from what we understand is it's partly owned uh, by a, a multi millionaire Israeli uh, businessman that's in the shipping uh, business. And this would mean that this isn't the first time one of his uh, ships have uh, been intercepted. In fact, in 2021, uh, one of the ships that he owned was targeted uh, by, at the time, what Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had said was Iran, even though Iran had, at the time as well, uh, denied that. Uh, well, here we are today, uh, 12 hours uh, a post uh, a, a video that was released by the Houthi, the Iranian-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen, and who had released a statement via video saying that they will uh, begin targeting uh, ships that they deem as Israeli because of the escalation and because of the situation in Gaza. Now, if you actually look at the map, it's a strategic location because a lot of those ships that enter via that bottleneck as you go up in the southern part of the Red Sea up all the way to the top will eventually lead you to the Suez Canal. And that is a main shipping lane and a main international shipping lane for the whole of the world that would pass all the way uh, from Asia to bypass going all the way around Africa, it would cut through that Red Sea and onto uh, Europe. Uh, what we understand is the ship was heading uh, from Turkey uh, to India. Uh, and that just gives you an idea of how strategic that location is and how much the Houthis are, are really going for uh, attacks against Israel. They are at least attempting to, with the drone attacks or drones that they've managed to fly to Elat in the southern part of Israel, and now this. Obviously, the international community will probably be quite concerned uh, given the situation. Yes, Sarah, as you're saying, I mean, we've seen attacks on the Red Sea, particularly on Ilat in the past couple of weeks since October the 7th. But this is the first time that a ship has been hijacked in this way. Uh, what do we expect the Israelis to do next? Well, last time this happened in 2021, when that explosion happened on that ship, uh, it took time, of course, to uh, say that Iran was behind it. Uh, but this time, it's been very quick to blame Iran. Uh, even though Israel says that it's uh, not fighting uh, a war on several fronts, it's trying to focus on Gaza. But it seems to be that this has become a regional concern, where you have uh, the uh, uh, um, Houthis in Yemen that are tar trying to target Israel. You also have the armed group Hezbollah, which is also backed by Iran on that southern uh, border with uh, the northern border, rather, with Lebanon. Uh, so it will be a major cause for concern because this really does show another level of escalation. You had uh, several attempts by the Houthis in terms of sending those drones uh, to try and strike. Uh, uh, Israel, especially in that southern area in Elat, uh, one of them had actually uh, seemed to have been a mistake that ended up hitting or targeting an area in Egypt, in Al Arish, in that part of uh, the country. But here you are now. Uh, this will be a major concern, especially for those uh, shipping companies uh, where uh, millions and multi million dollar business that could also uh, effectively affect uh, the uh, trade that will be going through from Asia via the Middle East to Europe and vice versa. Right. Thank you, Sarah. We'll let you go for now. Thank you for that update. Uh, that's Sarah Hayrat reporting for us. So now let's bring in uh, Dorsa Jabari uh, to find out whether there's been any Iranian reaction, Dorsa, to uh, 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 Israel uh, quickly pointing the finger at Iran. 
Yes. Uh, well, first of all, Darian, there has been no evidence uh, put forth uh, that Iran is behind this. This is an accusation made by the Israeli prime minister's office without any uh, concrete evidence uh, to support the allegations that Iran is behind this. Now, Iranian officials in the past few uh, weeks since the October 7th attacks have been warning that there is a potential for this conflict to escalate in the region. And we've heard from Iran's supreme leader, from the Iranian foreign minister, Iranian president, all saying that it's a very, very tense situation and it has the potential to escalate, as we've just seen today, that escalation taking place. But in terms of the specific attack, we've only just heard from the Iranian foreign minister who uh, issued uh, comments following a meeting with MPs, briefing them about the latest developments in the region. And Hossein Amir Abdullahian uh, said that the resistance groups are, quote, cleverly adjusting pressure on Israel and its supporters and have unactivated capacity for pressure. That's according to um, state media that the foreign minister has made these comments. Now, uh, Iran in the past has distanced itself from these uh, various uh, groups in the Middle East who are um, against Israel and the existence of uh, Israel as a country. Uh, the Iranians were the first, the Supreme Leader was the first to uh, comment after the uh, October 7th Hamas attack in Israel, saying that Iran had no knowledge of the attack. There was no cooperation between Iran's uh, Revolutionary Guard and Hamas fighters to plan or carry out the attack, and that Iran supports Palestinian resistance groups in uh, politically and um, economically in terms of uh, aid, uh, and very adamant that Iran had no part in that attack. Uh, but he, uh, we have heard since that uh, given Israel's continuous bombardment of Gaza and what they are doing, as Iranians uh, call it, a genocide of the Palestinian population in Gaza, uh, the conflict will spread. It will not be contained to just Gaza. And uh, the Houthis in Yemen are part of the so-called axis of resistance of groups that Iran has called um, meaning these groups that fight are against the existence of Israel and the occupation of Israel and Palestine. All and right. we've seen nearly 60 attacks take place from uh, Syria, Iraq, and uh, Yemen against um, Israel. All right, Dorsa, thank you so much. That's Dorsa Jabari reporting from Iran. Let's speak to Bara Shaban, who's a Yemeni political commentator who's been following developments, joining us from London. Thanks for your time. What's your reaction to this development? Well, I think um, it's an it's an interesting timing because uh, Yemenis um, have been uh, meeting in Riyadh. They were very close uh, to sign uh, what it looked like a permanent uh, ceasefire. Uh, but this seems to be a constant uh, challenge with uh, with the uh, with the Houthis, which is kind of it's going to be now a similar situation like Hezbollah, where basically one party um, is uh, deciding on behalf of everyone that whether they can. Uh, engage in a foreign conflict or not. Uh, now, in general, the Yemeni people have been uh, supportive of the Palestinian plight. Uh, the uh, public and official uh, uh, statements and position of Yemen as a country has been, in general, supportive of the uh, of the uh, uh, Palestinian cause. Uh, they, in general, uh, of course, Yemenis do not support no uh, normalization with, uh, with, with Israel. Now, that's the public stance. Uh, but they want to engage this within the Arab uh, framework. So they don't uh, would like Yemen not to be engaged with a with a foreign uh, conflict. The Houthis unilaterally the, the think that actually it is better for Yemen to be part of this, you know, so-called axis of uh, resistance. And therefore, uh, they they want to engage. They want to, to say, actually, no, we can do something. So does this can, have the potential? Um, does this have the potential then to escalate? Absolutely. I mean, this this risks escalating the uh, because now you're inviting the Israelis to respond. You're also putting the United States under a heavy spot because the United States kind of the guarantor for the security of the maritime routes across the uh, across the Red Sea. Uh, this put also a lot of pressure regarding the insurance companies. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about all this. In fact, strategically, in the right. So strategically, how significant is this development on a global scale? 
Well, it, it is significant because Yemen has always been important. I mean, it's it's kind of an, an interesting thing because when the situation, the conflict happened in Yemen, the main interest for the international community is this, for this conflict not to spill over and threaten the uh, international uh, international security. Now, this seems to be the case uh, the case right now. Uh, the other thing is that, of course, everyone knows about uh, when. Uh, the ships are being, uh, you know, uh, 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 threatened across the Red Sea. This basically puts um, uh, insurance companies, uh, ha you know, companies have to pay a higher price right now for any ship going through the, the through the Red Sea. And the Houthi leader himself had been uh, threatening. So right now, what the Houthis are saying that we were serious when Abdul Malik Al Houthi was announcing that he's going to hit uh, targets uh, in the Bab al Mandab Strait that we are serious and we mean business. So do you expect then Yemen and the Houthis to continue to play that card that they have with the Bab al-Mandab Strait? As we know, it's one of the world's busiest shipping lanes, carries about a fifth of global oil consumption. Uh, I think I, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I do, because the um, one of the things that the Houthis constantly aspire to is seeking uh, legitimacy through um, such actions. They want to tell their base, who remain, of course, in general, people in Yemen are supportive of the Palestinian cause, uh, that we are actually um, uh, helping in this uh, ongoing fight in, uh, fight in, uh, fight in Gaza. And uh, the, uh, uh, um, the other thing is because it also distracts attention from the demands of the Yemeni public inside. This is an easy scapegoat so that you can actually start engaging in, a, in, a, um, in, a, uh, in, a, in another conflict. And um, it, it doesn't cost much. I mean, you can, you know, they, they can continue um, threatening ships. And then uh, they know that the appetite of the international community to be engaged again in another conflict in Yemen is very low at the moment. No one wants to go into a fight inside Yemen. All right, we'll leave it there. Thank you, Bara Al-Shaban. Thank you for speaking to us from London.